So I'm gonna be speaking on someone that I don't know if I've ever spoken about uh, in all these years, and that is on King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. So this is gonna be a little bit of a unique story for some of you, maybe you've never heard it, uh, but we're going to be reading this together. And so in 2 Kings chapter 18, we're just gonna dive in here. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. So who was the king? Hezekiah of Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem, yep. Verse two, he was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mom's name was Abijah. And, and uh, he was the daughter, uh, and she was the daughter of Zechariah. Now watch this. Let's all read this together. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Now leave that up there. It's very important that you realize that what, what matters in life is not what is right in our eyes, but it's that we're doing what is right in God's eyes, amen? And in, in order to do that, we have to have a standard, right? So in other words, when we do things that are according to the word of God, we know that we're doing what is right in God's sight, amen? Now, there's also some definitions of how you know you're doing things right. Here's some of the things that he did that other kings did not do. Verse four, what's the first thing he did? He removed the high places, okay? Number two, what did he do? He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. Now this is amazing, we don't realize how much witchcraft is in society, and I've said it for years, and, and I had a family member recently, I saw her on the phone a few weeks ago, and I said, hey, your daughter's hugging a, a Pikachu uh, Pokemon, and Pokemon is absolutely demonic. You don't need to have anything to do with this stuff. It's, it's re, uh, rooted deeply in the occult, and, uh, and demonic things are attached to these things, and, and they, this family member just kind of said, oh, okay, whatever. And then they found this video that someone had sent them, and it just dug into all the stuff that was, that was there. That what, you know, we live in a society, friends, that there's a lot of witchcraft that's out there. And the devil has power. It's not greater than the power of God. But if you're not walking with the Lord, he'll absolutely use the power that he has to bring destruction in people's lives. And so this family member, man, they just started taking all this stuff out of their home and getting rid of all of this garbage. And we've done that many times. Some people that have come here haven't realized how demonic an organization or Disney is or Harry Potter, any of these things. And so from time to time, we'll have a smash and trash. We'll bring all these things to the house of God and we will burn it. And uh, not only did he, did he uh, take and smash the sacred stones, but he broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses has made, made. Now, many of you may not realize this, that God told Moses to make a snake, and that when the people would look at this snake, the serpent in the wilderness, they'd actually be healed. But how many of you know that that season had passed? See, sometimes we can idolize things that God has done in our lives before and make that the idol, not the Lord. Is anyone listening to me? So you can't make an idol out of something that God used at a time or a season because there's nothing magic or, or special about a stone or a trinket or this and that. The only power is found in the Lord God Most High. Amen. And so he smashed this bronze snake and, uh, and, uh, that had been made for the time of the Israelites had been burning incense. So anyway, he kind of brought the whole nation back. This is what husbands and wives are called to do, is smash the idols in your family's house. The things that are of the world, the music that is of the world, the programs that are of the world, artifacts, trinkets, things that people say, dream catchers, anything that you can find that people try to put a power to, you need to burn it. You need to get it out of their house. Amen. And you need to find a way, and we, you know, we're not celebrating these, these kind of festivals that people try to do, and they'll try to burn incense, and they'll do this and that. How many of we just need to serve Jesus? Amen. Now, this is a little radical, but Hezekiah, I want you to understand, Hezekiah had a heart for God. And it's so important that you realize that we do what's right, 
that we remove the high places in our life, we smash the sacred stones, and we break worthless idols in pieces. Some people have things in their life that they've been holding on to. Maybe an ex-boyfriend gave it to them, or someone gave it to them. And as long as you have that in your possession, the enemy uses that as a tie to that person. And there are times in your life where God will tell you, I want you to get rid of that thing. I don't want you to sell it. I don't want you to give it away. I want you to burn it, and I want you to sever every soul tie that you have with that individual. Well, I didn't expect to preach this this evening, but I just want to tell you that go through your home and you just say, Lord, what do you think? And you just go through your home, you go through everything, and you clean house. And how many of you know that's what Hezekiah did? Now, I said all this because it all leads up to verse 5, which tells us about Hezekiah. Verse 5 says this. What does it say? Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There's not a lot of scriptures in the Bible that say this guy trusted the Lord. How many of you would love God to say that about you? Now we say that we trust God, but Hezekiah showed us that he trusted him. There's a big difference between me telling you, well, I, I, I trust God, I trust God. It's another thing if I'm doing things and then God says, hey, you trust me. Amen. So, so we're, we're going to get to it. It's going to be awesome. So watch what it says. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or at, How many of you know this is pretty good? We need to know about King Hezekiah. Verse 6, watch what it, let's read it together. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. Isn't this amazing? And verse 7, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he did. See, friends, when you begin to trust the Lord, you begin to open up the door for God's blessing in your life. Trusting in the Lord is not an emotional thing. It is an act of obedience that brings the tidal wave of blessing of God into your life. In other words, the greater you can trust the Lord, the greater the the deluge of God's power and presence and miracles will begin to transpire in your life. I'll begin to show you that. So trusting the Lord is not just, just here. There's things that you do that show that you trust him. Amen. So everything he did was blessed. How how many of you know that's pretty awesome? Now this is key. Let's read this last verse in this, uh, last sentence in the the previous verse. Go back one. Look what he says. He rebelled against who? The king of Assyria and didn't serve him. So the king of Assyria was in the, the, uh, in, in the, the region, but not under Jerusalem, but he was a wicked king. And he would demand money from these um, uh, other nations for an allegiance with them and an alliance with them. But how many of you know we don't ever need to make an alliance with the enemy? And so he did not uh, serve this king and he did not have any alliance with him. He didn't give him any money. He didn't give him any tribute and he just served the Lord. How many of you know he's, he's on track so far, amen? Now, now true trust, friends, Now, actually, verse 8, from Watchtower to Fortified City, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. So what this does, friends, it paints a picture that when you trust God and you get rid of the things that you need to get rid of, guess what? You begin to take ground in your life. You begin to take authority that the enemy can't steal away from you. You ever felt like you're in a battle? Guess what? If you do the right thing, the enemy can't touch you. And if, he do, and if he does, then God surely will give you a plan to get out of the attack. Amen? Yeah. So now watch this. True trust is backed up by true action. So I can't say that I trust God with my money if I'm not a giver. I can say that I trust God, but until I actually become a giver, I don't trust him. Okay? If there's something that you're trusting someone with, how many of you know there has to be an action that goes along with your trust? Okay? 
Um, Hezekiah's trust, or, trust in the Lord compelled him to live the way he did. He wasn't like, oh, I got to go to church. Oh, I got to go. No, man, I trust God so much. I'm going to get myself to church on a Wednesday night because I trust that in the sanctuary, God's going to speak something to me. And in the sanctuary, God's going to speak to me something that's going to bring freedom and deliverance, not only in my life, in someone else's life. So as I get in God's presence, I'm trusting God to do something. So following Jesus is for our protection. Did you realize that when you follow Jesus, it's not like, oh, I'm just gonna be a good Christian. It actually brings God's protection into your life. Is anyone getting this? This is a good word, right? And so deviating from following Jesus is a lack of trust. When the enemy tries to come in and tempt you to do something, what he's trying to do is get you not to trust that God has a better idea. It's all rooted in trust. If you really trust the Lord, you'll do what he says. But when the enemy tries to get you to do something that you're not supposed to do, how many of you know that represents a lack of trusting that God has a better way? Am I talking to anyone tonight? We have to live our lives we have to live our lives in a way that we are truly trusting God. So, so far, so good. Hezekiah is doing good so far? Would you agree? Yes. Nicole, what do you think? Is he doing good? Good. Second Kings 18, in King Hezekiah's fourth year, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, marched against Samaria. So here's the king of Assyria coming in, and he laid siege to it. At the end of three years, the Assyrians took it, okay? This is another land. So Samaria was captured in Hezekiah's sixth year, which was the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel. Verse 11, the king of Assyria, now man, this is the bad guy. He deported Israel to Assyria and settled down in Haya, ha, I'm sorry, Hala, and Gozen on the Haber River and in towns of the Medes. Now here's where things get crazy. So in other words, this wicked king started coming in to uh, Hezekiah's neighboring communities and started taking ground. And this tells us why the king was able to do it. This happened, why? Because they had not obeyed the Lord their God. This is just like people that are in our lives. They're around our life. The devil hasn't quite messed with us, but they're around our life. And they, start, they started doing the wrong thing, and then all of a sudden the enemy starts eating their lunch. Am I talking to anybody? And they said, hey, they didn't obey God. They violated his covenant. And all that Moses, the servant of God, told them to do, they didn't do it. They didn't listen to the commands, nor carried them out. Right? They started saying things like, only God can judge me. They started think, saying things like, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. They started saying things like, I can smoke pot and God's okay with that. Or I can get drunk and God's okay. Or I can swear, or I can cuss. All these things that people will say, but God wants us to realize that when we follow him, there's protection. And when we start doing our own thing, that's when the enemy comes in. Right? Now, so there's trouble starting to happen. The neighboring regions around Hezekiah, they were compromised and the enemy pounced, okay? When we stop trusting God with the way we live our lives, the enemy can come in and begin and try to take ground. How many of you know that's what the enemy's trying to do? He's trying to take ground. You're in a battle, you're in a war, and you've been given, a, you've been given a, a jurisdiction, you've been given an authority that God says this is your land, the enemy can't touch it. You know what part of that land is? Your family, amen. You begin to put a hedge of protection around your family. You plead the blood of Jesus over your family. You get an unsupervised phone out of their hands in the name of Jesus. You don't let them sit on TikTok and YouTube and just watch whatever they want so the enemy can come in and put perverted images in their mind. Are you, is anyone listening to what I'm saying? The enemy is after the hearts and minds of the next generation, and the parents have fallen asleep. But God is raising up a group of parents that are going to say, nope, we're going to have discernment, and we're not going to let our children go the way of the world. We're not going to put a screen in front of our kid. We're going to put the Word of God in front of our kid and raise them for God. So they think differently. They think differently, right? So, so now that the Assyrian king was starting to conquer the region, and now he's coming after Hezekiah. 
And so that's what will happen. The enemy will try to mess with people that are around your life. He'll try to, try to get through them, and then, and then he wants to try to knock on your door. And in 2 Kings 18, 13, look at this. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria came to attack the towns of Judah and conquered them. So here, now, the region that Hezekiah was over started to be conquered. How many of you know when the enemy starts attacking, we better have the right response? How many of you know when the enemy comes in, we better have the right response? It is so important that we respond to spiritual attacks in our life, not with an ostrich and its head stuck in the sand, but we have to have a clear path that we're going to take in order to see God's power un uh, unleashed in our life. Amen? Now, look, th so this was a big deal because the, this king came in and started conquering the land. Now, at this point, I truly believe that Hezekiah should have gotten a hold of God right then and right there. He should have ran to God right there, got spiritual things going on, and he just said, you know what, we're going to stand against this. But instead... This is what King Hezekiah did in the next verse. King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria. Now, by the way, this was the same king that the Bible says that he rebelled against him. He didn't pay him any money. He didn't give him any tributes. He didn't want to have anything to do with this king. But the king started messing with his stuff, and so King Hezekiah sent this message to the king. What did he say? I have done wrong. Oh, really? 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 Well, if I just would have given in to my kid, you know, if I just would have just done, did, done this for Johnny, if I, if I just would have compromised just a little bit, my friend invited me to, to the Ilani Casino, and if I just would have gone there just once just to show them that I love them, if I just would have drank with them a little bit, if I just would have, if I just would have compromised a little bit, and this is what he said. He says, he says to this king, I've done wrong. I will pay whatever tribute money you demand if you just leave me alone. Guys, don't ever make a deal with the devil. Don't give him an inch. Well, King Hezekiah started, oh, okay, I'll give you whatever money. Just leave us alone. The king of Assyria then demanded the settlement, watch this, of more than 11, what? Tons of silver. And how much gold? Someone do the math, please. How much is an ounce of gold? A thousand? Two thousand. How many ounces in a pound? Sixteen. So how much is that? Is that 32,000 times 2,000 pounds, right? How much is that? Who's got a calculator? 32,000 times, times, times uh, 2,000 pounds. How many of you know that's a lot of money? But we haven't even forgotten about 11 tons of silver. 11 tons of silver. And so, so here's where the enemy will try to come in and try to get you to deal with him. You ever felt like the enemy was just breathing down your neck and you felt like, well, man, if I just give in a little bit, everything will be okay? That's where the enemy gets people. Instead of Hezekiah saying, no, I'm going to trust God, right? But God still had mercy on Hezekiah, and we're going to share that in just a moment. So to get, now look what he had to do. Talk about compromising. Look what he had to do to get this money. In verse 15. To gather this amount of money, King Hezekiah used all the silver stored where? Aha. First thing the enemy wants to do is take the money that's supposed to be used for the house of God and use it to pay the enemy's ransom. Took the money, spent it at the bar. Took the money, spent it on to trying to get to the jackpot. Spent it on the casino. Spent it on this, spent it on this. Now, his back is up against the wall. Why? Because he hasn't made God his trust. He slipped. So now he takes all this. He has to get all the money that's stored in the temple. But guess what? It's not enough. You know why? 
because it's never enough for the devil. You can, you can never pay him enough to leave you alone. Hezekiah even stripped the gold from the doors of God's house. And from the doorpost, he had overlaid with gold, and he gave it all to the Syrian king. Just leave us alone. See? You start compromising with money. When you start taking what belongs to God and trying to pay the enemy. I was telling someone earlier tonight on Chick-fil-A, what a blessed business. And you know why they're blessed? Because you know what they said? Sunday is God's day. Sunday belongs to God. So we're going to give our employees the right to come to church. Do you know how much money Chick-fil-A could be making every single Sunday all around the United States? Millions of dollars. But you know what they said? We're not taking what belongs to God to try to pay the enemy. It used to be, back in the day, some of you can remember on a Sunday, you could look down the street and everything would be, all the businesses would be closed. Why? It's a family day. Time from collard greens and green beans, right? And chicken pot pie. Family. Now everyone's trying to make a buck on the Lord's day. Right? I could tell you stories about that. I never, I always told God, I don't want to compromise my, my Sabbath. Amen. So anyway, so he gave all the money to the Assyrian king. You think that satisfied him? Nope. Instead of refusing to give in to the enemy, Hezekiah began to pay it off, pay him off. Only when... So when we, he started to pay him off and then he literally emptied nearly everything he had, it still wasn't enough. You know why? Because when the enemy takes a shot at you, you have to decide, I'm not negotiating even this much. Can everyone see that right there? You don't give the enemy nothing. He gets nothing. Nothing in your life. Zippo, zero, goose egg. <laughs> Nada. You give him nothing. You don't give him a song. You don't give him a movie. You don't give him a thought. You don't give him a word. You don't give him an attitude. He gets nothing. Now, it says that, uh, well, let me just explain this. When the enemy takes a shot, don't negotiate with him. Why? It'll never be enough. Never negotiate with the devil. Instead, trust in the Lord. Now, look at this greedy king. This greedy king, now the taunting starts. See, there's a pattern. How many of the enemy will try to just push people, push people, push people? Then he'll taunt them and beat them up over the very thing they weren't supposed to do. Am I talking to anyone tonight? So, so watch this. This is the king's response to all this. Nevertheless, the king of Assyria sent a commander, and now he wants to set up a, a, a meeting with Hezekiah to get more from him. And he even cut off the water supply near the road leading to the field where the cloth is washed. How many of you know things are getting going from bad to worse here? This king wanted Hezekiah to surrender his territory to him. The Assyrian king now wanted to form an alliance with Hezekiah and he wanted Hezekiah to surrender. So the Assyrian king, now he starts to threaten. Well, if you don't do this, you won't have enough money. Well, if you don't this, then this is going to happen. And, this, and how many of you know the enemy tries to work in the realm of your mind? How many of you know just a little while ago, everything was going good for Hezekiah? What in the world just happened? That's right, he stopped trusting in God. So now the king starts making threats. And he says, you speak of having plans in 2 Kings 18, verse 20. He starts taunting him. You speak of having plans of power and war, but they're just talk. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, God's going to help you. God's going to deliver you. And he says, and in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? 2 Kings 18, 23. He says, come now. This is what the king's telling Hezekiah. Come on, make a bargain with me the king of Assyria, and I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. 
You know how the enemy tries to get people to compromise many times? Money. Did I say it? Money. Money. If he can get you to compromise a little bit with money, he can trip you up. You know, Sonia and I, man, God has blessed our life. But you know what? It's not because we made a bunch of money. It's not because I went to see who would pay me the most amount of money as a pastor or a worship pastor. You know why? Because I'm not for hire. Are you understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to climb any ladder of success because only true success comes from hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. And so you realize that less is more when it's blessed by God. Amen. Anyway, I'm having way too much fun. So, 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 so this king is taunting him. All the taunts get worse, guys. He wants to make a deal, right? Second Kings 18, 25. What's more, do you think we've invaded your land without God's direction? In verse 25, the Lord told us, attack this land and destroy it. See, then the enemy will try to say, oh, oh, God's uh, trying to teach me a lesson. Yeah, that's what it is. If the enemy can't get you immediately into his plans, he'll try to confuse you to make you think that God's actually in the middle of it. Well, if I go to the bar, then, then this will work out. If I can just compromise, if I can just make this, this deal, if I can just do this, it'll be all right. God says no. So now the enemy's trying to use religious stuff. How many of you know the enemy knows how to quote scripture too? The enemy will try to talk spiritual as well as try to confuse you and intimidate the people of God. We have got to recognize when the enemy is trying to deceive us by bringing God into something. Right? 2 Kings 18, 27, watch this. But Sennacherib's chief of staff replied. I mean, they are still, still threatening him. Now, I'm sorry what I'm about to say, but this is like the devil. But Sennacherib's king of staff said, hey, do you think my master sends this message only to you and your master? He wants everyone to hear it. See, the enemy's trying to threaten the whole nation right now by telling pastors that they can't say anything about homosexuality and transgenderism or Disney or the public school system. And trying to tell people, shh, just don't say that, just don't say that. No, we cannot compromise and lose our children. Mutilating children. The state of Washington is one of the worst in the nation. Absolute perversion. And many pulpits are crickets. We need to be warning people to not put your trust in the government. And the schools are government schools. They get $15,000 for every single student that they enroll. Per year. So they have a vested interest. Now, the enemy kept taunting, and this is how wicked the enemy is. Do you think that this king wants just to mess up you? No, he wants all the people to hear it. For when we put this city under siege, they're gonna suffer along with you. They'll be so hungry and thirsty that they'll eat their own dung and drink their own urine. That's the way the devil talks. He's not just trying to mess your life up. He wants to wreck your children. He wants to wreck your family. He doesn't want to just hurt someone with a little drug. He wants them to overdose and die. He, he doesn't play around. Well, this is a strong message tonight, isn't it? I told Sonia, I said, did you know this is in the Bible? I apologized on Sunday for saying the word sewage. I thought, this is nothing here. It, it's like once we realize just how vile, how pathetic, how wicked, how evil, how demonic this world system is and that the enemy is behind all this stuff, we will wake up and say, God, I am going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to trust in money. I'm not going to trust in position or a job. I remember the story 
uh, boy, we were telling all these stories. So, so I, we were here in Cowlitz County, and uh, we had bought a house, and I was looking for a job. How many of you know that's a desperate position to be in? And I needed a job, and this company came to me and said, oh, you know, uh, we need a salesman that'll do this, and you can make 60 grand a year, and you can go and manage construction projects. And I had in-home sales. I did it in Florida. I knew how to sell construction projects, and this was working for a roof company. And this was a great, there's a total fit for me in the natural. And I, I talked to the owners, and man, that I had the job in the bag. And about five minutes before the interview was over, we were just kind of going through everything. He said, yeah, the last guy we had was a Jesus freak. <laughs> and he said, have you found the Lord yet? And the Lord said, what are you going to do? I need a job. I have family. I can make 60 grand a year. I would be away from my family a lot, but all I could see was dollar bills. And the Lord says, what are you going to do? And because the guy, he says, have you found Jesus? It's like time stood still. And I went, I found him. And right then, the interview was over. Oh, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, thank you so much for, for coming by and have a good day. And I lost the job. And then, right after that, God gave me my own business, and I worked from home for the next four years, five years, during which time I was home all the time, and it was very busy, but I was able to be with my sons and my wife, and that's when we started New and Living Way Church, right in the middle of all that. Jesus. Never compromise for money. Amen. Never. Trust God. Trust God with your money. Can I say that again? Yes. Trust God with your money. Many Christians do not trust God with their money. They don't. They, all they can do is they see their bank and they see what they can do and how much they can do and they don't trust God. Now, the enemy is threatening, right? It's pretty nasty, pretty significant threat. The enemy will try to threaten you, but do not give in to his demands. The enemy will tell you there's no other way. 2 Kings 18, 28 says, then the commander stood and called in Hebrew, and he just started talking and taunting. Let, and then he started saying in verse uh, 29, this is what the king says, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He can't deliver you from my hand. See, God tries to get people to doubt the men and women of God that are actually declaring the word of the Lord. Am I talking to anybody? Yes. Verse 31, the king of Assyria is saying, don't listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says, make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own. See, the enemy is always trying to sell you a bill of goods, right? And then verse 32, until I come and take you a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. Right? Well, I'm pro-choice. No, you're actually murdering innocent babies. That's what you're doing. You're not pro-choice. You're not, it's not planned parenthood, my friend. It's called, it's called murder, okay? Now, don't listen to Hezekiah is what the enemy's saying. He's just deceiving. And it says in the last one, do not listen to Hezekiah. He's misleading you. The Lord will deliver us. Verse 33, has the God of any nation ever delivered his hand from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad and where the gods of Seraphim and Hena, or not Seraphim, uh, uh, Sepharvim, Sepharvim, Hena and Eva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries ever came to Sandy's land for me? How can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Okay, go back. Verse 35. Now, you see, this is what the enemy's saying about America. This is what the enemy's saying about your life. 
Huh. Don't you know how many generations of people in your family have been messed up? Don't you know Uncle Charlie and this person, this person, that I did all this wreckage and all this stuff? My friends, it doesn't matter what the enemy was able to accomplish in other people's lives. If you will make a righteous stand in the name of Jesus, the Lord will give you the strength, the power, the protection, the anointing that you need to see his power released in your life. Am I talking to anybody? So, so the enemy's threatening, saying there's no other way. There's no other way. There's no, you ever heard, at the end of it, there's no other way this is going to work. There's no other way. No, God always has a way. Amen. I say, God always has a way. Amen. Don't look at what someone tells you. God will make a way. It. Now, in the middle of the taunting, it was very important how they responded. How many of you know when the enemy starts talking to you, you need to know how to respond? Look at what the king, Hezekiah, told all the people to do in the next verse. But the people, what do they do? How many of you know there's a lot of things he could have said? The enemy says, put it on Facebook, put it on Facebook. <laughs> send that text, send that text. You have to send that text. You have to make that phone call. Oh, you just have to say, you have to tell them that you're right and they're wrong. But these people, the king told them, shut up. Don't say a word. When the enemy's coming at you that bad, friends, don't even mention it. Am I talking to anyone tonight? Yes. Is this exciting? It's exciting? This is so exciting. It's now, so this, this, is, this is hitting them so strong. You got to know when to speak, friends, and you got to know when to keep silent. So you know what Hezekiah began to do? He says, you know what I'm going to do? I've gone way too far. I'm way down this road. <laughs> now, I'm just going to tear my clothes and I'm gonna put on sackcloth and ashes as an act of repentance and I'm gonna get a word from God. He came to the realization that he couldn't pay enough money he came to the realization that he couldn't work it in his favor anymore. He couldn't try to bribe someone or try to do things in his own strength. He and all of his cabinet, they all had the same outfit on. They went to the same store, right? They ripped their clothes. They put on sackcloth. They said, oh, God, what are we going to do? I mean, it was a mess. It was a mess. And Hezekiah and his cabinet, they tore their clothes and they went to the prophet Isaiah and they said, we got to know what God is saying about this situation. When you are under vicious attack, it doesn't matter what Fox News or CNN or Facebook or Instagram or your Aunt Judy or your uncle says. All you need to know is, man, I need a word from God. I need a word from God. I said, I need a word from God. I need a word from God in this situation. Thank God he'll give you one if you'll search for it. And so they went to the prophet and they had all these letters. The king had given them all these, this wicked king had sent all these, these demonic threats to him in writing. And so Hezekiah goes to the temple of God. He takes all these things. He says, God, you see this? You see this, God? This, this is everything that the enemy's trying to do in my life. Sometimes you got to get to a point where you lay, you lay it all out before the Lord. Don't tell your friends. Don't tell your neighbors. Don't tell Facebook. Give it all to God and lay it all out and say, God, this is what the enemy's trying to do to me. He, he gave it. He put it all out there. And he says, God, i got to have an answer from you. How many of you know that we need an answer from God? I said, how many of you know we need an answer from God? And, and, and so Hezekiah and his cabinet, they, see, they went to Isaiah, they said, we gotta know, we gotta know. If you truly want to trust God, you have to trust God enough to get a word. I'll say it this way, don't say that you are trusting God if you haven't gotten a word from God. 
Because then all you're going to do, instead of having a word, you're going to worry. You worry until you get a word. But you know what you need to do? Stop worrying and get a word from God. That's why when I was in prayer many years ago before my sons were born and the Lord spoke to me and said, you're gonna have two sons. He said, you're gonna have two sons. You're gonna have two sons and they're gonna be mighty men of God. So it didn't matter when a doctor looked at my wife in the face after she had postpartum cardiomyopathy and went into heart failure with Benjamin and the doctor looked right in my eye and he said, you cannot have any more children. I already knew that God had spoken to me and I had a word from God. And he tried to tell me what he did, and I said, I don't receive that in Jesus' name. And four, four, three and a half, four years later, here's Nathaniel here. Every time you see Nathaniel, every time you see Benjamin, you realize they're fulfillment of a word of God. Friends, you don't need to worry about anything going on in your life. You simply need to get a word from God. You don't need to listen to what the enemy's trying to tell you anymore. You simply need to get a word from the Most High God and let him speak to your heart. Get a word. Get a word from God. Don't rely on your own plans. And so Hezekiah had had enough of trying to do things in his own strength. If you want a word from God, you need a word, get in the word and get a word. You want a word from God? You start getting in the word of God. You start getting in the Bible. And you say, God, I need a word. I need a word, I need a word, I need a word, I need a word. And keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. God, I need a word. God, I need a word. I need a word. You know, I have to do that every time I preach. <laughs> every time we minister. Right, Ruby? We gotta have a word. We gotta have a word. In God we trust. Thanks, God, that's a great word, but what am I gonna say? I didn't get this sermon series off Amazon. 1995, right? People do it, you know. But the point is, is that if you want to get a word, get in the word and get a word. They humbled themselves and they said, I got to have a breakthrough, God. God, I got to have a breakthrough and I'm not going to leave. And I'm not going to have my phone in my hand scrolling through TikTok so I can try to get a word. Sorry, friends, you're not going to get it there. TikTok is the sound of you wasting your life. TikTok, TikTok, I'm wasting time on the internet. TikTok, TikTok, my calling, I'm wasting it. Make sure that you're right in the middle of what God has for you and you'll have more fun you could ever imagine. Amen. Come on, don't waste time online. Now, we're gonna wrap this up here. Whew, this is intense. What's gonna happen? Dun, 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 <laughs> right? <laughs> pretty wild, huh, Molly? It's pretty crazy, huh? <laughs> they humble themselves, they get a word. So what do they do? God speaks to Isaiah and said, oh man, the devil is defeated, big time. You see, instead of listening to the enemy, smash what's wrong in your life, build up what is righteous, when the enemy attacks, don't negotiate with him, get a word from God and trust him. Now I wanna show you something as we close tonight. Okay, this is a shofar. If I say to Carmela, Carmela, I'm gonna trust you with this shofar. Okay? I'm gonna trust Carmela with this shofar. Are you ready? I'm gonna trust her with it. I'm gonna trust her with this shofar. Oh, you guys are, you guys are quick. <laughs> How many of you know I can say, I can sing, I'm going to trust Carmela with this so far. I'm going to trust her 
right? I can say I'm gonna trust her. I can say I'm gonna trust you. Oh, I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna trust you. I can shout it, I can yell it, I can cry it. But how many of you know, I still got it. I can't say I trust her until I let it go. Right? And I can't. I don't want this. <laughs> Pastor, what are you doing? I thought you said you were going to trust Carmela with it. I am. Don't judge me. I trust Carmela. I trust her. God bless you. Let's, let's pray and prophesy. Oh. How many of you know, once I told her, I trust her with it, I gotta let go. The things that you're holding on to that you totally haven't said, God, I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna give it to you. See, then he says, okay, God, I, I, now I'm gonna trust you. Don't hold on to it. So just a little while later, there was a word that Isaiah said, the prophet, the man of God, and when you get a word from God, nothing can stop it if you'll stand in faith. And God said to Hezekiah, Hezekiah, I'm gonna deal with this. Now when God t gives you a word, when God gives you a word, you can stand on it. So God told Hezekiah, I'm going to deal with this myself. You're not even going to have to deal with it. I'm going to fight this for you. And in verse 35, once a little time had passed, that night, 2 Kings 19, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up, they were all dead bodies. Whoa, what in the world happened here? The same army that was taunting, the same army that said, oh, if you just join us, you'll have all this good stuff. You'll just have all these wonderful things. The same army that said, choose life. Now they had 185,000 dead soldiers. Yeah. See, the enemy will never win. God's people will always have the victory if they'll stand in faith. Now look what happened. When the people got up the next morning, there's dead bodies everywhere. So Sennacher, the king of Assyria, he broke camp. He freaked out. This same guy that was telling him, oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. No, he returned to Nineveh. He stayed there. Oh, it gets worse. One day, while this wicked king was going into the temple of what? His God. That, that's the God of money. That's the God that a lot of these politicians and businesses that are caving to this, this uh, transgender agenda and the homosexuality and, and divorcing and just trying to find out uh, anybody and ha having all the things you want to do in life. He said he went into the temple of his God Nisroch, well, that's a crazy name. While he's in the temple worshiping his God, his own sons came in and killed him with a sword. Why? Because the fruit of wickedness will always turn on itself. They escaped to the land of Ararat and Isarhad and his son exceeding him as king. See, I want to say this in closing. The king, this king, wasn't killed because Hezekiah was all that. See, the battle that you're facing right now, friends, the battle that you're facing is not about you. It's about your king. It's about who you represent. 
It's about the kingdom that you represent. The Bible says that we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God and we are clothed with the light of the gospel of the power of God and we are clothed with the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit and the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and our loins girt about with truth. We have been clothed and called as ambassadors and we're fighting an ar- we're fighting a battle but God is the captain of the Lord of hosts who is commissioned us to represent the kingdom of God in the earth today. It's not your battle. Your, 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 your thing doesn't say, I'm, I'm a member of the Ojeda army or I'm a member of the Rogers army. No, you're a member of the army of the kingdom of God. That's who you represent everywhere you go. And so we know that as we get close to God, things begin to happen. It says in 1 Peter, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. How many of you know the Bible says you gotta cast your care? Just like I had to take that shofar and I had to cast it over to Carmel. I had to say, you know what? I'm not gonna hold that anymore. Psalm 22 says, in you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and they were saved. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. Can I say this? God does not disappoint his people when you trust him. God doesn't disappoint his people when they trust him. The question is, keep the scriptures up there. If you will simply come to a point of saying, God, I'm gonna trust you and you're gonna do the thing that you need to do to show God that you trust him. I'm talking to some people tonight that need to give some things to God. 2 Samuel 22 says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. It's not the people that say they trust him. It's not the people that are trying to trust him. It's the people that trust in him. It says in Psalms 20, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. No matter what situation or circumstance you're you're facing right now, friends, or your family, God can give you enough faith for everyone around you and say, don't fear, don't fear, trust the Lord. Get to church, do what God has called you to do. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we'll trust in the lame and the Lord. We'll remember. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your, this is the thing, lean on, that, that means don't try to figure it out. I'm talking to some people tonight. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to reason it out. Well, that doesn't make sense. No, friends, God isn't asking you to figure it out. God isn't asking you to come up with some kind of equation of how it's all gonna work out. That's his job. Your job is to trust him. It's God's job to do the impossible. It's God's job to do what you can't even begin to think of. You need to let him be God, and you just need to be trusting him. Isaiah 26 says, trust in the Lord on Sundays between 10 and 12 o'clock. Is that what it says? Come on, help me. What does it say? How long, pastor, how long do I have to keep trusting God for my family? God, how long do I have to keep trusting God for my friend, for my spouse? Forever. How long? For in Yah, for in Yah, that's what I loved about Sonia's last name was Sonia. I said, how do you spell that? She says, S-O-N-J-A, what? H, she had the H. And I knew right there, bingo. Trust in the Lord forever. Some of you need to post this in your bedroom, right? Your mirror, trust in the Lord forever. You go over to the bathroom where you weigh yourself on the scale. You put your thing and you got your, you got the scale here and you got the wall here. And right here it says, trust in the Lord forever. You walk into your house, you put it in your living room, put a big sign that says, trust in the Lord, how long? Forever. You go in your bedroom, you trust in the Lord, how long? Right? God sees.
Because in Yah, the Lord is what? Everlasting strength. Why? Because I'm going to trust in God forever. Let me try this side of the room. There's strength. Why? Because I'm going to trust in God forever. If you begin trusting in God forever, there's never a time when you're not going to trust him. If you're going to trust God forever, that means when you wake up, you're going to trust him. When you get the weird text, you're going to trust him. When you get the bill in the mail, you're going to trust him. When you get a funny phone call, you're going to trust him. When you hear something weird, I'm going to trust him. Why? Because in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. 